we will now come back into session. Uh, we are going to begin the second session of today's hearing on the credibility of credit ratings, the investment decisions made based on those ratings and the financial crisis. This second session is credit ratings and the financial crisis. We are joined today at the witness table by Mr. Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and Mr. Raymond McDaniel, the chairman and CEO of Moody's Corporation. Gentlemen, I'd like to start, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'd like to start by doing what is customary for all witnesses in all proceedings. I'd like to ask you both to stand and be sworn. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to provide the commission will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the best of your knowledge? I do. I do. Thank you very much. Uh, we will begin by offering uh, both of you the opportunity to make an opening statement um, of no more than five minutes. I don't know if I, I know that Mr. McDaniel has prepared a statement, and I don't know, Mr. Buffett, if you want to avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, but I have no statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, that'll cut five minutes <laughs> off the agenda. Uh, and Mr. McDaniel, I think what we'll do is take your opening statement and then we'll go right to commission questions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the commission. My name is Ray McDaniel. I'm the chairman and CEO of Moody's Corporation, the parent of credit rating agency Moody's Investor Service. Moody's appreciates the important work this commission is undertaking. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome the opportunity to contribute our views regarding the role of credit rating agencies. Over the past several years, we've witnessed events whose magnitude many of us would have thought highly unlikely. The turmoil in the U.S. housing market that began in the subprime residential mortgage sector led to a global liquidity crisis and a loss in confidence in the U.S. and global financial system. The impact has created a great hardship for many Americans. American families have lost jobs, homes, and college and retirement savings as a result of this financial crisis. Moody's is well aware that the crisis of confidence in the market has also impacted the confidence in the credit ratings industry. At Moody's, our reputation is our single most important asset. For 100 years, Moody's employees have brought their insight and integrity to rating trillions of dollars of debt and hundreds of thousands of obligations across a broad range of sectors, asset types, and regions. Their record for providing predictive credit opinions has earned Moody's a strong reputation among capital market participants worldwide. However, Moody's is certainly not satisfied with the performance of our credit ratings for the U.S. residential mortgage-backed securities and related collateralized debt obligations over the past several years. Indeed, it has been deeply disappointing. Starting in 2003, Moody's did observe a trend of loosening mortgage underwriting standards and escalating housing prices. We repeatedly highlighted those trends in our research and we incorporated them into our analysis of the securities. By 2006, we were requiring an unprecedented level of credit protection. However, neither we nor most other market participants, observers, or regulators anticipated the severity or speed of deterioration that occurred in the U.S. housing market or the rapidity of credit tightening that followed and exacerbated the situation. And even our enhanced credit protection requirements were insufficient to ensure rating stability. Today, with the benefit of hindsight, Many observers have suggested that the events that ultimately came to pass were inevitable and easily predictable. As they were occurring, however, various outcomes were considered possible. Market experts in both the public and private sector had differing views about the ultimate performance of the U.S. housing sector and its potential effect on the rest of the economy. These questions persist today. The economic downturn exposed serious vulnerabilities across the infrastructure of the global financial system. For Moody's part, there's been an intense level of self-evaluation over the past few years. Members of my management team and I have solicited ideas and perspectives from both inside and outside the company. We've sought to better understand what caused the poor performance of our ratings in this sector, and we've sought to improve the assessment of credit risk in a fast-changing and unpredictable market environment. We've undertaken numerous initiatives to improve the credibility of our ratings and strengthen their quality, transparency, and independence. These actions are extensive and have occurred in six principal areas. We have strengthened the, the analytical integrity of our ratings, enhanced consistency across rating groups, improved the transparency of ratings and the rating process, increased resources in key areas, bolstered measures to avoid conflicts of interest, and we continue to pursue industry and market-wide initiatives. In each area, we've made good progress. Still, I believe that more can and should be done. 
We wholeheartedly support legislative and regulatory reform efforts that will reinforce high quality ratings and enhance accountability without intruding into the objectivity and independence of rating opinion content. At Moody's, we are firmly committed to meeting the highest standards of integrity in our rating practices, quality in our rating methodologies and analysis, and transparency in our rating actions and rating performance metrics. Thank you. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. All right, we'll begin with uh, the question. So, um, and I will as custom start and then move to the vice chair and then the members who led this uh, research and investigation effort into credit rating agencies. Uh, let me start by saying the two issues I'd like to probe with you gentlemen today are really uh, the following. Uh, first of all, uh, business and management practices, um, corporate responsibility, management accountability, for starters. Second issue I'd really like to look at uh, and talk with you about is the model for credit rating agencies in the financial market. So, Mr. McDaniel, let me start with you today. Um, and let me ask you very directly. And, and by the way, the reason I want to say that these issues of corporate governance, leadership, accountability are important is in trying to assess how we had this run-up to the financial crisis. We have found over the course of months that there's very little, there's a lot of fingers pointing away, very little self-examination. Um, so let me start with you. Under your leadership, there, there were, in the end, for whatever reasons, very significant failures at Moody's. The product that your company offered, which are ratings, for the benefit of investors, proved to be highly defective, and not just by small measure, but by a large amount. 83% uh, of your AAA-rated uh, securities in the RMBS area in 2006 were downgraded. Um, in 2007, 89% uh, of those which were uh, investment grade rated were downgraded to junk. Uh, and massive downgrades, I ought to note, started in July 07 when housing prices had, de had declined just 4% from the peak. Some have said that the very enterprise was fraudulent, if not in a legal sense, but in a practical sense, because the products did not closely approximate, wh approximate what they represented to be. Uh, if we had flipped a coin with respect to your 2007 ratings, it would have been five times more accurate in terms of the result. Your shareholders have lost 73 percent of the value in the stock from the peak to today. Uh, the ratings enabled the issuance of trillions of dollars of mortgage securities, which we now know were rife with significant problems, uh, from fraud to misrepresentation that may have well fueled the housing bubbles. Investors who relied on the ratings suffered enormous losses. And your company's reputation, something I know that Mr. Buffett uh, has held important, reputation within business, is certainly under significant criticism. My question for you is really, who should be held accountable? We have a system of capitalism in this country where we have regulatory mechanisms, we have owners, boards, and management. Who should be accountable if not you? The performance of the, the uh, housing sector and, as a result, the ratings uh, that are associated uh, uh, with um, housing assets um, clearly uh, have exhibited very poor performance um, in recent years. Uh, there was uh, decades uh, of strong performance leading up to uh, the current crisis. Um, we believed that our ratings uh, were our best opinion uh, at the time that we assigned them. Uh, as we uh, obtained new information uh, and were able to uh, update our judgments based on the new information and the trends we were seeing in the housing market, uh, we um, uh, made what I think are appropriate changes to our ratings. So uh, I am deeply disappointed, as I said in my opening remarks, with the performance of ratings associated with the housing sector. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that is... Uh, injurious to uh, the reputation of the firm uh, and to uh, the long-term uh, value of the firm. And uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the regret uh, is genuine and deep with respect to our, our ratings in the housing sector. But, l but let me probe this a little further. I mean, just as a kind of – look, and I've been certainly wrong as much as I'm right. I know it's hard to keep, uh, predict peaks and valleys. Um, but let me just say there's almost a common sense test here. Your firm rated 42,000 tranches of uh, RMBS, AAA, from about 2000 to 2007 in a context where there's four 
uh, corporations in the country, used to be a few more that are rated AAA. In the context, you were rating about 90% of these securities as AAA when, in terms of the corporate debt world, where you actually have more transparency. You can get in, look at all the public filings, understand the corporate debt. Only about 1.4% of that was rated AAA. You led an enterprise for which you were compensated pretty handsomely, $39 million over this period. I guess what I'm getting to is if American capitalism is about risk and reward, rewarding success, rewarding failure, should there have been a management change at Moody's? Don't we need to have a culture in which success and failure are essentially accounted for in our capital system? Uh, as I, uh, as I uh, remarked uh, a moment ago, uh, we certainly believed that our ratings um, were appropriate when they were assigned. Uh, and I recognize that uh, those ratings um, have not performed um, well in the housing-related sector. Uh, and as a result, um, we uh, did make um, management changes. Uh, if you're, but not at the top. If you're asking, no board, no board or to, CEO changes or. Uh, if you're asking with respect to me, which yeah. uh, I can see you are, uh, it's a fair question. Uh, and and uh, if we reach a point where either our shareholders, or our board of directors, directors, or I don't believe I am best positioned to lead the firm, the future. Uh, then I will not be in my job. Okay. Mr. Buffett, any observations on on the responses by Mr. McDaniel? Well, I've probably been more draconian than you have in terms of my view about the CEO's responsibility and I just haven't been as widely quoted. <laughs> well, it, and, and, and in terms of financial institutions that have failed and are required assistance by the, by the uh, federal government, I think that, uh, that uh, when society has to step in, to save institutions uh, for societal reasons that the CEO uh, should basically go away broke, and I've said I, I think his spouse should go away broke. I mean, I, I think there ought to be a real downside, and I think incentives are an important aspect in behavior. Uh, in the end, you know, I'm not, I don't know who, except for maybe John Paulson or Michael Burry, would have uh, uh, been running Moody's and coming up with different kinds of ratings. Uh, there was the greatest, the greatest bubble I've ever seen in my life, and I've read about bubbles all the way back to the tulip uh, bubble. Uh, the entire American public eventually was caught up in a belief that housing prices could not fall dramatically. Uh, and uh, Freddie Mac believed it, Fannie Mae believed it, Congress believed it, the media believed it, I believed it. If I'd seen what was coming, would I have held my moody stuff in, in the 60s or something of the sort? Uh, <clears throat> very, very few people could appreciate the bubble. And that's the nature of bubbles. It's, they, they, they become mass delusions of sorts. So I, I am much more inclined to, to uh, come down hard on the CEOs of institutions that caused the United States government to come in and, and, and uh, uh, necessarily uh, bolster them. Uh, then I am on somebody that made a mistake that 300 million other Americans made. Well, but let me probe that a little because, uh, you know, I, I just want to say for the record, I, I do think around the country there were people who thought the bubble was unsustainable. I don't think there was a secret here. There were a number of experts, whether it was Robert Schiller or, or uh, Mr. Rabini uh, or Mr. Baker, Dean Baker. There were a number of people who saw this bubble. We did have this unprecedented rise, 89% in home price appreciation in seven years, something we'd never seen historically. Um, but kind of, you know, moving beyond that for a minute, uh, the rating agencies did play a fundamental role in accelerating uh, essentially the securitization, and therefore some would argue the origi origination of products that tended, out to be, tended to be highly deficient. We're talking about low teaser rates, negative amortization. There was a warning in 2004. Uh, from the FBI that uh, mortgage fraud had become so epidemic uh, that if unchecked it would result in a crisis as big as the uh, SNL crisis. I mean, there were many red and yellow flashing lights along the way. There is a um, country song by Don McLean where he says, when the gates are all down and the signals are flashing and the whistles are screaming in vain and you stay on the tracks avoiding the facts, you can't play you can't blame the wreck on the train. 
Wasn't the role of the rating agencies, though, to be referees in a game that got out of control? You told our staff that, well, gee, if they had not done the ratings, they would have been howled at by con Congress. But don't we expect referees to make the call, yeah, we expect even if they're going to get booed? Yeah, and they, they made the wrong call. I mean, they, they, they basically believed, as most of the American public did, and, and you couldn't have had this size bubble without overwhelming. And the Cassandras were there. But who was going to listen to John Paulson in 2005 or 2006 or Michael Burry? I mean, they, it didn't mean anything. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, look at me. I mean, I, I was wrong on it, too. I recognized that something pretty dramatic was going on in housing, but I, I actually called it in the annual meeting when I got a question on it, a bubbleette. Well, that was a, that was a terrible term to use. It was a, it was a four-star bubble, and the rating agencies missed it. And, you know, it's, as I say, uh, you know, you could look at the March 30th, 2007 report to Congress by uh, Ofeo, which had 200 people overseeing Freddie and Fannie, and they, they basically gave them a green light on asset quality. Well, I actually think I take a different view that if you look at Ofeo's reports, which we've had access to, they raised a number of issues. But moving on from that, um, you had you said the ratings business was a wonderful business. Uh, you've said that, you know, as a matter of fact, because it's a duopoly, little capital required, enormous pricing power. Um, turned out to be good for a short time, not necessarily, I think, the model that works best for the marketplace. But I want to return to this matter of corporate governance and accountability. Um, you are the largest shareholder, and I realize by all accounts you were not a particular, in fact, you describing you as not particularly active would probably be uh, too aggressive. You had very infrequent contact, I think only twice with Mr. McDaniel and maybe a little with Mr. Rutherford when he, uh, during the years he would come to visit you. But I want to probe the responsibility of shareholders. This was a company where 50.5%, I think, of the shares are held by five large owners. You had this tremendous spike in revenues coming from structured products. We've heard today from, and, and in the course of our uh, interviews, a lot of concerns about the change in culture at Moody's, the pressure for profits, sacrificing ratings quality. I guess I, I would ask you, what do you think are the appropriate roles of shareholders uh, and boards of directors in monitoring companies? What, what responsibility to kind of look into the culture, problems that are arising, and, and did the board and the shareholders do what they should have done in this respect? Yes, I, I, in, in 2006, I was not sitting there thinking that, that uh, the housing bubble was going to get as large as it did, or as it was actually, and that it was going to burst. And, and like I say, if I had, I probably would have sold my stock. Yeah. So keep, I want to keep at this a little. I mean, given the, the dramatic consequences that have happened here, and I do think there have been reputational damage. I think you once famously said it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. If you, th if you actually think about that, something like you'll do things differently. I, I guess the question is, in the end here, the ratings were wrong. There are reputational issues. There's been a massive loss of shareholder value, and the whole business model's come apart. I mean, should there be a new board? Should there be new management after this kind of change? Uh, I would say that in this, in this particular case, I think they made a mistake that virtually everybody in the country made. And, and going back to that O'Fair report, that, March 30th of 2007, it was reported the enterprise's overall asset quality is strong. That was March of 2007, and all they owned was mortgages. Well, I will just say, you know, arguing with you about what the markets were saying, but I mean, this was not a big secret. This is The Economist. After the fall, shows housing prices falling like a brick. There were a lot of warnings. Even Moody's.com, Mr. Zandi is a very capable man. So I guess... You're saying the magnitude of the mistake doesn't, in the end, warrant change in management, relook at the culture of the corporations. Certainly, not. it's not necessary. And incidentally, I don't think the Economist ran an article called "Before the Fall." This was 2005. Yeah. All right. Let me um, let me move on and ask um, this uh, one last question, to you, Mr. Buff, and then back to both of you very quickly. Uh, we interviewed a member of the Moody's board, Nancy Newcomb, who indicated the board was not particularly involved and didn't discuss significant issues like the ratings process. There was a recent press account, I think, in the McClatchy newspapers about a, the disengaged nature of the board, but also said that two senior executives approached you with significant problems at the company. No. 
No? No. Okay, so not accurate. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to talk to you both briefly about the model for credit rating agencies in the context of this marketplace. It seems to me there are, you know, uh, uh, the worst of, of many worlds here. You have an issuer pay model by its nature that creates pressure to produce uh, credit ratings to serve the interests of the issuer, not the beneficiary of those. Um, in fact, Charlie Munger has said, I think as you know, whose bread I eat, his song I sing. I've seen him say that a number of times. You um, have the duopoly with enormous pricing power. Uh, and in the end, you have also business has, a, has had a whole set of legal uh, protections, including First Amendment protections. It seems to me like a pretty toxic brew of corporate not responsibility here. Uh, do you think radical surgery is necessary? For example, Mr. Buffett, uh, do you think we ought to outlay the issue, outlaw the issue or pay model? Do you think we ought to adopt the Franken provisions uh, in the Senate bill, which would say that rather than issuer selecting rating agency, they should be selected by the SEC? What kind of radical surgery it might have, had it been performed early enough, might have helped in the sense that these rating agencies would not have enabled this flood of toxic mortgage securities? Well, as, as chairman of Berkshire, I, I, I hate issue or pay. I mean, we pay a lot of money and we have no negotiating power. As I mean, treasurer of the state of California, it, it, I, I deeply resented the model myself. Yeah, well, it, 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 makes, it makes for a wonderful economic model for the business, but as a practical matter, I have nego no negotiating power. I need a Moody's rating and a Standard & Poor's rating. I need both of them. It's required in many cases by uh, the rules under which our life insurance company operates or our property casualty uh, company. So if they say to me, my bill is a billion dollars, and I say, gee, uh, you know, I'd like it to be 900000 or I'll go down the street, essentially there is no down the street, and, and that's the nature of it. Now, if you go to something other than user pay, it gets very tricky because uh, <laughs> Who am I, you know, if my, if, if, if my daughter's going to buy a $10,000 municipal bond, is she going to pay for a rating uh, for somebody? No, she'll, she'll hear the rating someplace or be published in some book. And, but you know. UL, UL does it, United Labs now, that's a nonprofit model, so you don't have the profit pressure. Uh, Consumer Reports does it. Is this a broken model? Well, if Consumer Reports would want to rate bonds and people would accept those ratings, I, I suppose it could happen. But it, it, it would require a pretty fair expenditure of money to rate thousands of municipalities and thousands of corporations. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not arguing that this is the perfect model. I'm just saying it's very difficult to think of an alternative where the user pays. I'm not going to pay. What about selection of r raters by other than the issuers, for example, by a panel? Yeah, well, in effect, you've got selection now by, by directive. And, and in effect, I am told by the Nebraska Insurance Department, you know, which raters I have to use in terms of establishing. But what about that as a change? Might that have obviated some problems? Should it be done and might it have obviated I, I, problems? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. It would, uh, the wisdom of somebody picking out raters, you know, uh, is that going to be perfect? I don't know. Okay. Well, the, uh, uh, there are several um, alternative business models that uh, rating agencies operate under. Uh, the largest rating agencies operate uh, under an issuer pays model. Uh, and I think it's important uh, for us to uh, acknowledge and recognize uh, that any business model uh, in which uh, the fee payor has an interest in the outcome um, is a model that has potential conflicts of interest and that those conflicts must be managed transparently and properly. But can, uh, they, can they really, you know, if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, since you raised O'Fail, mm -hmm. I mean, here are institutions that had this push-pull. They had the you know, the, the mission, but also the profit motive. The profit motive is pretty, pretty powerful, both on the issuer side and in terms of your business model. Can it really be overcome? I mean, it's nice to say that it's like transparency. Everyone loves transparency. And then they also say we can, uh, we can uh, you know, we can handle our conflicts. Is it really resolvable? Because it doesn't appear to have been based on this uh, latest period. Well, the... the uh, poor performance of ratings from the 2006-2007 period in residential mortgage-backed securities and, and other uh, related uh, securities, uh, housing-related securities, has not at all been replicated um, elsewhere uh, in the business. 
Um, so to the extent that there is, is a concern that we cannot have superior ratings quality, even in the midst of a severe economic downturn, um, I, I, I think is, is uh, a misunderstanding. And as I said, uh, because the, the uh, parties that are willing to pay fees for ratings, whether it be issuers or investors or governments, um, have an interest in the outcome of those ratings, I don't see how to avoid potential conflicts of interest. And we, we also, under the issuer pays model, have an important public good that is produced, which is the ratings are made available to the general public for free. Um, there is no selective disclosure of the ratings. Uh, large institutions do not have an advantage over smaller institutions or individuals in terms of the access to the ratings. And I, I think that's an important public benefit. Okay, but I want to probe this because this goes to management. Now, look, this structure of products division was a cash cow. I mean, this is a classic case sometimes if it's growing like a weed, maybe it's a weed. I mean, you went from about a hundred and some million dollars in revenue in this section to seven hundred million, and there are questions about whether you staffed up enough to do it. It became fifty-three percent of your revenues. I mean, it became a huge part of your business to say, "Well, we did find out we just missed here." I mean, the miss was huge. I mean, ninety percent downgrade. I mean, even the dumbest kid in the class gets ten percent on their exam. I mean, it seems to me that the resources were not applied to understanding these products. I mean, I happen to come from the real estate business. I asked your folks earlier today, did you actually have due diligence teams that went to the ground to places like Riverside or Bakersfield, where Mr. Thomas is from, or Sacramento, where I'm from, and take a look at the borrowers, uh, the nature of the home markets? It doesn't seem to me you built in the capacity from a management standpoint to really do structured products well. I mean, this was a huge new industry that yes, brought in revenue, but it doesn't seem to me from a pure management perspective, and I think this is my point, Mr. Bubb, it wasn't just a mistake that the resources to understand this were put in place. We've spent countless hours here trying to understand the modeling, and the truth is, if you look at the modeling, data was put in that was relatively, frankly, incomplete, inadequate. There was a lot of human judgments, but there wasn't a lot of ground level due diligence, in fact, none other than visits to originators. So isn't that a significant management failure to not have built in the capacity. Might you have missed this less had you been truly on top of this in terms of understanding the products? Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we certainly believed uh, we were on top of this and we believed that the information that was being made available was adequate. Uh, there are other parties uh, in the marketplace who have other roles and responsibilities with respect to uh, evaluation of properties and, and uh, uh, review of, of uh, uh, mortgage applications. Uh, so uh, we are analysts. Uh, we consume uh, that information. Uh, we believe our role is to look at the information and look at the data and, and process that as part of our rating committee uh, analytical process, not to uh, replicate or duplicate roles that others in the market uh, Which they occupy. didn't do. Which they didn't do. Uh, it, it would appear that in some no, cases they, didn't they have not. No, they didn't do it. They didn't have fraud detection, underwriting standards, went to hell in a handbasket. Mr. Buffett, any observations on whether was, this was just a pure modeling mistake or whether, in fact, it was also a lack of attention in terms of the depth of due diligence? Well, I mean, if, if, can I say something? You're a big advocate. Let me just kind of, mm -hmm. you're a big advocate. Do your own due diligence. Absolutely. So here you have an entity that's a surrogate due diligence provider in a sense. And, you know, even whether people fully rely, having looked at real estate investments, you can ask the third party. Be, but if you're going to outsource due diligence, you would hope your due diligence entity would be doing due diligence. Shouldn't rating agencies, shouldn't they have done actually ground level due diligence, sipping those blizzards at a Dairy Queen rather than just looking at the revenues? They really, they, they, they really looking back, they should have recognized. But like I say, I didn't recognize it. And most everybody I know didn't recognize. They should have recognized this was a huge bubble. And I, as I understand it, they had a, something in the model, and I may be wrong on this, that there wouldn't be a correlation throughout the country uh, uh, of the same experience. And, and it's true that in the past you'd have had a housing boom someplace that had been sort of localized, but this was a nationwide bubble. Well, and, 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 and so cor diversification among states didn't really make that much difference. It was worse to be in Nevada and Arizona and Florida, but, but it happened every place. And, Nin and 91 to 93, we had actually a national 2% uh, decline in, in house prices because of the big drops yeah. in places. And, you know, there is that old line. I mean, you know, one rotten apple can spoil the bunch. I mean, this was an instance where half the 
apples may have been rotten. I mean, the correlation assumptions, I think, were not very well defined or thought out. Um, all right. I've asked you plenty for right now. Um, let's move on to the vice chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Buffett, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the subpoena, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for the subpoena. <laughs> I wanted you to have a framed copy for your wall. I, I think it's it was, already up. I think it was good cover because then you can tell others that you don't want to go to if you got the power, use it. I, you know, I admire that sort of structure. <laughs> I also don't have anything for you to sign. Hmm. But when I was younger, uh, when Monday Night Football began, uh, Don Meredith and Howard Cosell where the team and Don Meredith would launch in at least once a game with the um, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Uh, and at this point, I'm not interested in going after the uh, ifs and buts because uh, there were plenty to go around. Uh, I am a very strong supporter and have tried to maintain the argument that behavior has consequences. You can do it when your ability to threaten someone with something, either as an incentive or as a negative, can influence that behavior. But I am very concerned about the amounts of money that were generated in a structure that provided those short-term opportunities and no long-term downside and apparently no moral angst over having done it. And there is to a degree, I think, an argument that this is basically, uh, you know, somebody's idea of unfettered capitalism to a very great extent. Um, you've made comments in that regard. How concerned are you that we're able to get this genie back in the bottle to the point that if behavior has consequences, you want to claw back monies that they have? I don't see anybody being able to put that structure in place. I think How do you feel? I think it can be put in place, but it, but it requires a whole new level of thinking. But the, I think you're, you're absolutely right. The incentives affect behavior, and when you run a huge financial institution who's stability or instability can affect the entire society, I think there ought to be a tremendous downside. It's fine if there's a tremendous upside, too. I don't have a problem with that. But I think that, that for somebody's, if somebody's personal equation as CEO of some large financial institution is that if they ruin the place, they walk away with $100 million instead of $500 million. And if they succeed, they, maybe they get a billion. I think that is a crazy structure. And I think that boards of directors should not sign on for such a structure. And I think that the boards themselves should bear heavy penalties when, when an institution has to go to, uh, to the uh, federal government. And I think that that should not be insurable. So I, it wouldn't be as draconian as I have with the CEO, but I would, I would want to focus the attention of somebody running a huge financial institution on the fact that their mistakes could, could cause uh, big problems for the society. Thank you. Um, I. I thought I got out of the business. I did 32 years, and I didn't think I was going to be back on this side of the desk <laughs> asking questions of witnesses again. But I said yes to this because of the way uh, this commission has been structured. It's basically um, my belief that it's just pure public service. Uh, I, I thought it was wise of the Congress to structure us not to look for answers to those ifs and buts in terms of projecting forward what we ought to do, because frankly, Congress is trying to address those, and I'll have a question on that in a moment. But our job is just basically to try to explain the financial crisis and, and do it as accurately as we're able with the resources uh, that we have. So one of the reasons I was pleased to have, notwithstanding the subpoena, the coincidence of you being in New York and our desire to be in New York, to have you in front of us. So that uh, I would hope that the answer that you would give me to your question uh, isn't the one that virtually everyone else has given, because it's not unlike the behavior and the consequences. The answer is somebody else. and and. 
given your reputation, but frankly, reputations are only as good as your balance sheet. You've got a really good reputation yeah, yeah. in terms I'll of for that definition. Um, in terms of understanding <laughs> how things work. In your estimation, I don't want to drag us through this business of woulda, coulda, shoulda, ifs, and buts. We have legislation moving through the House and the Senate that hasn't gone to conference yet, and it isn't locked up. And I have kind of preached uh, to anyone who wants to hear that committees have such narrow jurisdiction that you're not going to be able to solve the fundamental problems, whatever they are, as we examine them with a single bill that's principally gone through two committees that have roughly the same jurisdiction. You're just not going to hit it. So what I would like you to do, and I would ask both of you that if uh, the commission provides you questions in writing, would you be willing to answer them because we do not have the ability in the time we have to get to what we really need to do? Would Mr. Buffett, would you be willing to do that? Sure, I'd do that. And incidentally, I did have a very good session with your staff that was recorded for two hours. And, and we have that and we read it. And I, I, I really think they did a good job of asking both good questions and good follow-up questions. So I, I would hope some of the material might be in that, in that record. Uh, and, and we're reviewing it to make sure it is. Mr. Yes, McDaniel. we would do good. so also. What, what do you think the House and the Senate has gotten mostly right? in the legislation that's moving through Congress and where, if there are obvious misses, uh, I don't think we need to deal with subtleties now. It might be in some uh, follow-up written questions. Yeah. I haven't read the 1,500 page bills. And no one side. has, including <laughs> some of the co-sponsors, sure, so that, that's a denial that's okay. Okay, but I've got two, two thoughts, basically, that yeah. I think I would address if I were that. One is this question of incentives. I mean, I, I think it is very important. I, I think it's, I, I think no one has any business running a huge financial institution unless they regard themselves as the chief risk officer. They are responsible for the ship. And if they aren't, they should be willing to take that on. Somebody else should be in that position. So I think there has to be huge downside for the CEO and significant downside for the board if government help is required. The second thing I think is that, is that part of any huge bubble uh, is, is excessive leverage, and, and it's very hard to define leverage because you're going to have some institution that's 10 for 1 and their assets are all treasury bills and it doesn't make any difference, and you can have somebody that's 3 for 1 and it can be all second mortgages and you got lots of trouble. So it's not easy to define, but, but it, the, the size of the pop of the bubble was accentuated in an enormous way because of the leverage that existed in the system, and some of it was hidden, you know, mm -hmm. off balance sheet type things. and. Uh, uh, but I would, those would be two points I would try very hard to address intelligently. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you want to ask a question? Yeah, just one on, on the uh, kind of incentives, upside and downside. And I, I do want to just return, because you've talked about financial institutions, but the very structure, again, of credit rating agencies, it does seem in the end that there's lots of upside, you know, as a structured product business group, but very little downside, legal protections, uh, and, and by the way, I think there's a fine distinction between financial institutions that receive federal money I do too. and, mm -hmm. I might add, a credit rating agency that's a full participant in the system that got us there. So wasn't this system tilted in terms of lots of upside and no downside? I think much of corporate America is tilted that way. But yeah. you would say that applies to credit well, rating I would, I, agencies. I, would, I, I think. They I know you're an owner, but come on. <laughs> no, I think. I, help me here. We, we've seen significant downside. I mean, there's no question that the, that the mistakes that were made at Moody's and Standard and Poor's have affected both Moody's stock and McGraw Hill stock in a big way. I have no right to ask you this, but just as the rating agencies produced whatever a triple A was, and then investment banks and others were able to take the leftovers, restructure them, and turn them into more triple A's rated by an agency. Um, you really need to speak out even more than you have about fundamentals. Uh, there aren't very many people who can command the respect, and I know you were really busy out there on a chair in front of a number of different channels, uh, but you've got to do more of this. This may be your real legacy. Well, 
I, I, I've spoken out on some things, but I, I, I don't disagree with you that, that, that uh, perhaps no one spoke out enough, you know, in, in, in the past years during the bubble. But, but certainly I could have done more. My, my partner, Charlie Munger, sometimes makes up for me, though. He, he speaks very loudly. <laughs> but I, I, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Thomas. Because once Congress acts, the ability, as you well know, to act again to move into areas they weren't able to initially political becomes virtually impossible. Sure. You only try to clean up the area that you moved with first. First, This isn't nearly as comprehensive mm -hmm. as it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, it may even need to move to tort and other areas. So I am not, I'm going to turn my time over to others who might want to quiz you from a very particular point of view. Mine's simple. Uh, capitalism has changed in your lifetime. And my concern is that in those who are watching, it gets better, which means responsibility, moral obligation, and behavior has consequences. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. We are now going to move to Senator Graham. And um, yes, wheel the chart. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Buffett, Mr. McDaniel, for your insightful comments. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, uh, you said that Moody's had incorporated the research uh, into its rating process. Uh, the chart that's about to be uh, placed. Uh, Can we please place it where we placed it before, Karen, so we do not obscure commissioners? Yeah. And if you have to move the chairs, move the chairs. Stop the clock. Even though we should charge the senator not, for that. Not, 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 <laughs> not in the Jericho sense, however. The real time keeps ticking. All right. Move on. Uh, this uh, chart indicates the uh, mountain of RS, uh, RMBS uh, securities that were rated by Moody's as the blue and the red are the CDOs, and then in yellow boxes are some important events. Uh, the first of the yellow boxes is in October of 2006, when, for instance, on the CDO uh, line, it was something south of uh, $10 billion issued. Uh, when Moody's Research uh, Service issued a report of the first paragraph, the executive summary, saying the U.S. housing market downturn is in full swing. New and existing home sales and single-family housing construction are sliding. Inventories of unsold homes are surging to new record highs. House prices are falling uh, in an increasingly number of areas. Uh, and the word crash is used to describe the situation uh, in areas of the country which represented about half of the uh, outstanding mortgages. Uh, how was that information incorporated uh, into the uh, subsequent rating processes of Moody's? Uh, the uh, Moody's analysts and Moody's rating committees have uh, information from uh, other parts of Moody's as well as uh, information from other firms and uh, governmental services. Uh, available to include in their um, uh, rating committee deliberations and their analysis. Uh, so, and they do use uh, multiple sources of information, uh, including the uh, source uh, from uh, uh, Moody'sEconomy.com. Yeah, recognizing that this internal document as well as external information is available. Question is, how in October of 2006? was this incorporated into the rating process? I, I don't know exactly how it was used in the rating committees. The concern is that uh, immediately after that dire prediction was issued, the number of CDOs went from uh, $10 uh, billion dollars a month to over $40 uh, billion dollars a month in less than 90 days. It doesn't seem as if the uh, the announcement of severe problems correlated with the actions that were taken. 
Uh, I believe that, that the rating committees would include um, any information they believe relevant um, in their deliberations. Could you, as a follow-up, give us some more specific information as to what did, in fact, happen in terms of incorporating uh, this research into the rating process uh, in October of 2006? Yes. And on my time, can I just amplify that? Because this, this came from, obviously, Moody's.com, Mr. Zandi and his team, very well respected. Could you, as part of that, actually do a chronology of what management did very specifically, how folks reacted to that report? Because it's pretty dramatic. It uses the word the market's going to crash in 20 um, uh, metropolitan areas. So if you could give a very specific timeline about who did what when at, at, from the top levels on down. Uh, I will do that, and, and I, I should just add that uh, I believe at this time, even um, with the, the analysis that uh, Moody'sEconomy.com was uh, producing, uh, their expectations were, were far uh, more moderate in terms of, of what was going to happen in the housing market than what, in fact, uh, has eventuated. So I, uh, I, I just want to make sure that uh, uh, there's no misunderstanding in the degree uh, of downturn that they were expecting at that time compared to what we've seen. One of my concerns, which is not peculiar to, to the financial industry and, and, or to rating agencies, but seems to be uh, endemic across our culture, uh, is the avoidance of warning signs until the situation de degenerates uh, into a catastrophe, whether it's the failure to, to see the consequences of new technologies in deep water uh, petroleum extraction but not changing safety and response capabilities uh, or some of the signs that have led to the now the, the financial collapse. Uh, the first panel made up of people who all had had experience at Moody's gave a number of reasons why these warning signals were not uh, acted upon. And those uh, included the, the desire to increase a market share the lack of, uh, of ability to walk away from a deal, uh, the lack of human resources to keep pace with the rapid increase in the number of CDOs that were being evaluated, uh, the lack of adequate independent research capabilities, uh, the fact that the banks were misleading the rating uh, agencies and manipulating the process. Those were some of the items that were listed. Uh, do you uh, concur with that list, and are there other items that you would add to the list of why were the warning signs missed? Uh, there are some things I would concur with and, and some others that I would not. Uh, and uh, uh, to highlight uh, two that I think are important, uh, first of all, we uh, agree that having uh, a robust, uh, independent uh, research and credit policy function um, is important. and. Uh, uh, we have made changes um, in both the uh, uh, number of, of individuals and the independence of the credit policy function uh, over the, the past three years. Um, uh, could, second, excuse me, could I yes. ask, one other uh, issue was the fact that the committees that were doing the rating seemed to be devoid of people either from the real estate industry or from the uh, banking uh, industry. Uh, and therefore uh, had little personal capacity uh, to uh, evaluate what was happening in those areas. Have you taken some steps to broaden the, the pool of background on the rating committees? That, uh, again, um, in, uh, in the category of lessons learned, um, greater cross-disciplinary expertise uh, in rating committees, I think, is, is important, um, and we have made uh, important uh, strides in, in accomplishing that, and, and I think we've made very good progress. Uh, could you, in, could yeah. you give us some information on that subject that we asked the first panel uh, for what was the status of those rating committees during the period of uh, 05 forward? Yes. Uh, with respect to um, being unwilling to walk away from a deal, I believe, was one of the, the comments that you had related. Uh, I, I, I simply disagree with that. Um, we uh, did not rate 
um, hundreds, probably thousands of uh, 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 residential mortgage-backed securities uh, tranches, um, particularly the junior securities, even though we looked at them, uh, our opinions uh, 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 were, were not such that uh, uh, the issuers uh, wish to have those opinions, and, and we did not uh, uh, rate those. We have sat out um, entire uh, market sectors um, for credit reasons, where we have credit concerns. Uh, and um, uh, that is, is uh, because the ratings quality is paramount. Um, we don't always get it right. Um, predicting the future uh, is an uncertain uh, process. Uh, but uh, I, I, think that, uh, I think that there has been uh, a misunderstanding of our willingness to, to stay out of markets where uh, our credit opinions are more conservative or we have credit concerns. What about this issue of uh, misleading <laughs> or manipulative activities by banks? Well, certainly, if we're aware of anything that is misleading or manipulative, um, we would uh, we would not uh, uh, use that information or or pursue uh, rating a transaction uh, with an institution that's providing that. Well, the the testimony that we had was that uh, the banks would not disclose information which was requested, uh, and the. Uh, the analysts didn't feel that they could push back against the banks to make that a requirement of their uh, issuing the rating. Uh, our methodologies are, uh, I believe, clear in terms of the information that uh, we need to rate an instrument, uh, and I believe that we pursued uh, uh, that information uh, uh, consistent with our methodologies. Uh, there may be additional information that would be um, uh, interesting to review, uh, which may or may not have uh, an influence on, on our thinking on credit, but uh, uh, certainly we would, we would look to have all of the information that is consistent with our methodological approach. Mr. Buffett, uh, this, is a, this is a broader uh, mm -hmm. question, but I know you have a uh, an excellent reputation of being the risk manager for uh, for your firm, and that and you feel, as you've said today, that you feel that's a principal responsibility of the CEO. Why do you think that, as a society, we seem to uh, have missed so many uh, signals across a range of areas? Uh, in the well, but rising prices and discredited Cassandras from the past blunt sensitivities and judgment, even of people who are very smart. I mean, initially, my old boss, Ben Graham, you say you get much more trouble in investments with a sound premise than with a bad premise, because the bad premise you recognize immediately doesn't make any sense. When you have a sound premise, namely the Internet's going to be very important and eyeballs are going to be important and all of that, initially, that it makes a lot of sense. After a while, the rising prices of all Internet stocks cause people to be able to raise billions of dollars for things that are nonsensical. A home is a sound investment. I mean, it is a, 66 or 67 percent of the people are going to want to be in one. And if you believe house prices are going to go up next year, you're going to stretch to buy one this year. And, and the world enabled people to stretch. After a while, rising prices became their, their own rationale. And people decided if buying one house was a good idea, buying three houses was a good idea. If buying a house you can afford is a good idea, buying a house you can't afford is a good idea because it's going to go up in price. And people who lent money said it doesn't really make any difference whether the guy's lying about his income because uh, if the house goes up in price, we'll get our money back anyway. So rising prices are a narcotic that uh, affect the reasoning power of up and down the line, people even that should have had the experience. Isaac Newton you know, participated in the South Sea bubble, originally got out, and then he couldn't stand prices going up any longer, so he went back in and got cleaned, you know, and this is a fellow that generally was regarded as being pretty bright. So it, it, rising prices are uh, eventually, we had it in farmland in, in, in the Midwest, and it was a worse recession for us than this housing recession because people just felt they're not making any more farmland, there are going to be more people, they're going to eat more, farmland's going to get more productive. <laughs> And the rising prices eventually created their own their own destruction. On my time, just quickly, but but okay, if it's a narcotic, but don't we expect that regulators, credit rating agencies, uh, not partake of the narcotic? Isn't that their role? Well, you would hope so, but it's not easy to 
to avoid. I mean, well, still, but you don't, you, know, you, know, you don't want your police trading in crack. I mean, no. you want them stepping back. Yeah, and we had Chairman Greenspan talk about, you know, uh, irrational exuberance in 1996. But it, with all, with the power of his podium and everything else, we had a great internet boom after that. That was, I know, you know, but that was the nature of my questions about who's responsible: regulators, shareholders, boards, management. Someone must be. But I'll, I'll turn it back to. I want to ask a different uh, question, Mr. McDaniel. During this uh, period of the last uh, five years, how frequently did representatives of various regulators, from financial institution regulators to the SEC, uh, visit uh, Moody's to talk about your rating methodology and uh, to uh, inform themselves as to what it was that you were doing? They're the ones who have imposed regulations requiring the use of your rating services, how, uh, how close a supervision uh, or at least uh, a monitoring of activities did they maintain? Uh, pursuant to the Credit Rating Agency Reform Act of 2006, um, which became effective uh, in, uh, I believe it was September of 2007, um, there has been uh, uh, multiple uh, inspections and reviews of our rating processes and, and practices by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, prior to uh, that period, uh, the oversight was, was um, uh, less intensive because uh, there, there was not a regulatory framework uh, that the SEC was operating under uh, f for uh, an inspection and, and review uh, regime. They, Prior to that uh, legislation, uh, are you saying they did not seem to think that that they had some responsibility having mandated or given strong incentives to use the rating agency's products as part of the management of regulated uh, activities, that they had some responsibility to be aware of what that rating constituted and how it was being assembled? Uh, I, I can't speak for the Commission, but uh, I, I believe that um, uh, the, the regulatory oversight um, uh, uh, opportunities were more limited prior to the legislation uh, passing, and so they were not uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, extensive in their oversight of, of Moody's or the industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Graham. Um, Mr. Wallison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for coming here, even one under compulsory process, <laughs> but uh, voluntarily still. Thank you. Um, and let me start with you, Mr. McDaniel. And uh, you were here this morning for the earlier panel. I, I heard most of the earlier panel, uh, not all of it. I just was wondering whether you heard anything that about your company that was a surprise to you or you did not know? Uh, the, the issues that were uh, raised um, by some of the individuals who are uh, more critical uh, of the company, um, I have heard before. Um, and in fact, we have uh, investigated uh, uh, those, uh, those um, uh, issues uh, previously, um, including through use of an external uh, law firm and uh, found uh, the, uh, the uh, concerns that, uh, that were raised to be uh, uh, without merit. Well, there was this question, I thought, of enhanced, uh, what, what you, I think, referred to when you were talking about enhanced analytical integrity. I think you were getting at the point that uh, there were pressures, perhaps, on the, uh, on the uh, talent that you have, the analytical talent, um, to produce ratings. Um, is that what you meant by uh, enhanced analytical integrity? And what did you do to prevent that from happening? Well, um, in, in the context of my prepared remarks uh, with respect to enhanced analytical integrity, uh, I was referring to uh, some of the actions that we have taken since 2007 uh, to separate, for example, our credit policy function from the line of business uh, uh, ratings uh, analysts. Uh, to have more uh, cross-disciplinary participation in the rating committee process uh, and, and to um, create further separation 
uh, of uh, any person who is involved in commercial activities for the firm from people who are involved in analytical well, let, let's activities. Let's talk specifically about this one issue, and that is uh, are analysts now permitted to talk to uh, issuers or the representatives of issuers? Is that still permitted? Y yes, analysts uh, do speak to issuers. And you're not concerned that there are pressures brought on them as academics? Uh, or people who are academically inclined by people who are much more ambitious and forceful, that is not a, that, you don't see that as a problem. I, I think the, the uh, communication uh, between an issuer of securities and an analyst of those securities is important uh, and should continue. Um, the analyst may have questions about financial information or management strategy uh, at the issuer. Uh, the issuer's um, uh, uh, future plans with respect to its capital structure, et cetera. So I, I do think those, those communications um, uh, for purposes of uh, creating the most predictive credit ratings we can produce are, are useful. Is there a, a manager who oversees the analysts and uh, can be available for discussion of these issues? Uh, there, there are managers who oversee our analysts, yes, and they would be available. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you one final question, uh, a very general one, and that is, what is your view of what caused the financial crisis? Uh, in terms of, of direct causes, uh, uh, certainly uh, the uh, weakening uh, of the housing market, the softening of that market, um, and then importantly, uh, the, the very rapid uh, tightening of credit uh, for mortgage borrowers who uh, needed to refinance um, uh, in particular uh, uh, greatly uh, exacerbated uh, the issue that uh, the, the sudden uh, tightening of credit uh, in the midst of a softening housing market um, uh, I think uh, uh, produced the kind of, of uh, large and rapid problem uh, that we saw. So it's, it's principally a problem of people not being able to finance, uh, refinance, that, that, uh, yeah, that which was, caused failures? Uh, I think that was uh, an, an important contributor. It, it, okay. uh, it, it acted as a catalyst. Um, Mr. Buffett, uh, we've had housing bubbles before, uh, quite a few, and a other kinds of asset bubbles before, right. most recently a, an oil price asset bubble. Um, this one was really quite special. Um, I want to press you a little bit on this because I'd like to get your sense of why this one was special. Why did it get so large? Um, why uh, did someone with your astute knowledge about the economy not see that this was an extraordinarily different um, bubble from one we've had before? Well, I wish I could give you a good answer to that. I, I, it, it, was a, it was really the, the granddaddy of all bubbles, and, and it affected an asset class of 22 trillion. You know, I mean, it, was, it, it hit everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, Mr. McDaniel mentioned people refinancing. I mean, they were betting on the fact that the following year that they, they couldn't make the payments they could refinance. And, and, and of course, the figures show that by the hundreds and hundreds of billions that happened, but uh, when it gathers momentum, I, I, you know, I, the, the internet bubble went further than I would have thought it would have. Uh, um, we did have that farm bubble in Nebraska where, you know, right. the, things went crazy for, for a while, and, and, and the, the early Cassandras do look kind of foolish as they go along, and, and when your next door neighbor is making money, mm -hmm. you know, very easy uh, by buying a second house, you know, with very small down payment, after a while, uh, it sort of gets to you, and uh, maybe you figure you should be doing it too. I, it's, uh, it's been a history of bubbles. I mean, I, I never understood why tulips were worth what they were back in, you know, but in the for, Netherlands. But for, for you in particular, yeah, no, and you've had it. many years to watch our right. economy, and uh, to economists in general, rise, sharply rising prices are a signal that something is peculiarly going on in the, in the right. economy. Well, um, I, you saw the prices rising very quickly, um, but you still didn't think that this was something that um, could eventually collapse. I didn't think it would pop like it did, no. I, I, interestingly enough, in 2005 and six, and I believe I've got the time period right, 
I get offered businesses for sale periodically. A significant percentage of the publicly traded home builders, one way or another, let it be known that they would like to sell out to Berkshire Hathaway. And looking back, I should have, I should have figured out uh, what I didn't figure out. <laughs> uh, were they asking more than once? <laughs> oh, it, it's interesting. I never had, it, I never heard from them. You know, in, in many decades in business, and all of a sudden, three or four of them showed up on the doorstep. Uh, you were once an owner of uh, Freddie Mac. Right. So uh, you are familiar with how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac operate. Um, do, uh, do you see their activities as having any role in the growth of this bubble? Well, I think they were doing, <clears throat> doing what they were instructed by Congress to do to, to a great degree, but I, they took on uh, weaker forms of mortgages in greater amounts. I mean, that's been covered in some of the reports. That, and so they, and, and they also bought uh, you know, they, they would require a 20% down payment, but then they would buy mortgage insurance from other entities. And I've looked at the profile of some of those loans and, and material I got from the mortgage guarantee uh, organizations. And frequently, a, very, a significant percentage of the time, more than 50% of the income of the borrower was going to mortgage payments. That's not sustainable. And, and, but whereas they were laying that off with a mortgage guarantee insurance company, they were still in effect, helping people participate in something that was really, unless housing prices kept going up, was going to lead to big trouble. Why did you sell your Freddie Mac stock? <clears throat> I, I sold it for several reasons, but uh, I think we were the largest shareholders of Freddie Mac. And uh, uh, at one point, the well, it was it became apparent they were getting more and more entranced by by trying to report increased earnings every quarter. And and any financial institution that tries to do that, in my view, is going to get in trouble sooner or later. And, and they, they became quite, quite interested in that particular, having that happen. Uh, they also, at Freddie, as I remember, it was either RJR bonds or Philip Morris bonds, but they bought some bonds that had nothing to do with housing at all. And here they were using what was in effect the government's credit to enlarge the size of this hedge fund type portfolio. Now with some corporate bonds that had nothing to do with housing. And I just figure if you see one cockroach, there's probably a lot. More in, um, in the kitchen. Did did, uh, did you follow Fannie and Freddie enough to know that they had affordable housing requirements? Uh, oh sure, yeah. And uh, did you know the the size of those affordable housing requirements? Yeah, and, and of course, <clears throat> they were predicated on being able to use the tax credits that that, that uh, were involved, and they set them up as assets on their balance sheet. And of course, they have no income now, so so those those became very dubious assets. But uh, were you? Were you aware then that they were buying the kinds of mortgages that they were buying in order to comply with the aff affordable housing requirements that they Well, I certainly knew they were. Yeah, they, 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 were <clears throat> they were mandated in many of their activities by Congress, uh, no question about that. And they were also trying to serve Wall Street, and that's a, that's a tough balancing act. Uh, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. <laughs> Four minutes and 51 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> you are quite famous for saying, um, among other things, and this isn't the only thing you're famous for, but you said that uh, credit default swaps are financial instruments of mass destruction. And yet it's recently come to light that you actually participate actively in that market. Yeah, I, I, I think I actually said derivatives are, are financial, uh, potentially. And, and, and I think that used improperly, as they almost are certain to be, uh, because of what they provide people to trade in them and what they provide in the way of increased leverage that's not obtainable uh, in other ways, <clears throat> I think that they have, they pose system-wide problems. And, and what, do said, you, what do you use them for? Uh, I use them to make money. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I think they're mispriced, I buy them. Uh, but you are, these are credit default swaps or other kinds no, of No, we've, we've never bought a credit default swap. We've sold credit default swaps. Yes. We sell you sell, we sell protection, insurance. You sell protection. We sell insurance. The protection side. Yeah, well, we sell it on municipal bonds. We sell it, yeah, on and corporates. And then do you, do you lay that off? No. Do you, uh, you do not no. hedge that? No, I never lay it off. So you do... Uh, we sell insurance. Uh, this is much like what AIG did, right? They didn't well, lay off. I don't think it's, don't think it's much like it. But, <laughs> 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 but, but we, sell, no, we sell credit insurance. No, we sell, we sell auto insurance, and AIG sold auto insurance, too, I mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I have no further questions. I, I Thanks very much. Could I bring up one point in sure. connection with it? Because it gets back to a point that was made earlier about the laws getting on the books and never getting changed. If you go back 
to the 19, late 1920s, we had a bubble then. It was in stocks, and it was partly caused by extreme margin by people that really didn't know what they were doing, 10 percent margins. And they had commission hearings after that, and they decided that, that this was a societal problem. Uh, and Congress gave to the Federal Reserve the authority to regulate margins, and they said this is important. The Federal Reserve still has that authority, as I understand it, you know, 70 plus years later. What we put in derivatives and total return swaps, you know, at that point you could borrow 100 percent of what you own. And so we sit here with a system, and I brought this up a half a dozen times, and sometimes with people in Congress, and I say, what in the world are we doing when we say the Federal Reserve should have margin requirements, which I believe now are 50 percent, and you can go to a, and get a total return swap and borrow 100 percent, or you can buy S&P index futures with a tiny percentage down. I mean, it is, it is something that should be addressed. I, I, thought, I thought your, maybe I misread this in the newspapers, but I thought your problem with uh, some of the legislation that is going through had to do with the fact that you didn't want to put up the collateral, which substitutes well, in for the margin. Well, in, in terms of, in terms of Contracts that were negotiated several years ago, there was one price for collateralized contracts right. and another price for uncollateralized. We simply, and, and incidentally, Coca-Cola, Anheuser-Busch, thousands of companies negotiated under that basis. We say if we're required to substitute an uncollateralized contract and, and make it a collateralized contract, before we send that money to Wall Street, we should get paid for the difference in those two types of, of, of contracts because they are two different contracts, just like changing the price or changing the maturity. And there's a, a norm, there's a very significant difference in price. And not only we, but hundreds of end users would be required to send money to Wall Street firms uh, contrary to the contract they originally uh, negotiated and contrary to the price differential that existed between those two types of contracts. So you don't have any objection to doing it in the future as long, when you use it? Oh, no, not, not in the least. I don't, I don't even object to, I, I just don't, I, I, I object to selling one kind of a contract and having change, having change into another kind of a contract without getting paid. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Mr. Wallace, if you can flip that mic off. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with Mr. Buffett, largely because my 90-year-old mother is watching and she'd be very disappointed in me if I didn't uh, no, acknowledge your seniority. <laughs> there you are. Um, I, I take it that one difference between AIG's selling of credit insurance and yours is that you charge enough to cover the risk that you're undertaking. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, but it's, additionally, we only take on risks we can handle ourselves. So we only have about 250 contracts or so total. and. If everything goes wrong, we can easily handle it, and, and that was not the case with AIG. Indeed, it was not. Uh, let me, let me, I want to address a general question which I've sort of been putting at a lot of these hearings about how we might restructure the incentives in the market system to try to avoid these kinds of crises in the future. You, you said, Mr. Buffett, that you liked this business at Moody's because it had pricing power, it was a natural duopoly. Uh, this gentleman, Kolchinsky, who testified a little earlier today, who's a subordinate of Mr. McDaniel, said that in many ways the incentives for rating agencies have become worse since the credit crisis. There are now more rating agencies, and they're all chasing significantly fewer transaction dollars. The new controls put in place by regulators are too weak to significantly alter this dynamic. Um, and then uh, there's a quote that you also had in your testimony that you gave privately to our, our team. Market systems produce strange results, and Wall Street in general, the capital markets are so big, there's so much money that taking a small percentage results in a huge amount of money per capita in terms of the people that work in it, and they're not inclined to give it up. Um, and then one last quote I want to uh, read to you, uh, but I will tell you that, quote, whenever I hear the terms modernization or innovation in financial markets, I reach for my wallet. It's usually what they mean is revenue producing. So we've seen a number of things go on in the marketplace. And you've also said that everyone should have a lot to lose in this marketplace. Well, really, in this securitization process, we've discovered through the course of our hearings that really almost everybody involved has nothing to lose. <laughs> the mortgage brokers who originate the mortgage get paid a percentage of the mortgage they originate without regard to the consequences if it succeeds or fails. The bankers who put the deals together, the mortgage-backed securities, are getting a percentage of the deal, the lawyers who write the prospectuses, the auditors who, accountants who audit the books, and the credit rating agencies who rate the credits are, are all 
basically paid in cash at the conclusion of the sale of these securities, really without any significant consequence to whether they actually do what people represent them to do or they fail. And one thought that some people have suggested is that rather than pay all these market participants in cash, that you might, in, you might increase the likelihood of diligence being properly done if you paid them in the securities themselves. So if you're getting whatever, yeah. 10 basis points of the dollars, give, them the, secure, give the security to booty so that you know that, that you're going to live with that security for a long time. You're going to be long in it. The, you can bonus the people that did the, do, the job with the same security. If they, if they succeed, they get 7% interest per year for 10 years, then they get their money back. Okay. What, what do you think about that idea? Or, I like it. I put it. Or put it in a deferred account and have an index of all the things in which they participated uh, become the index factor that's applied to that deferred account when it's finally paid out at some point. I, you have to, and I, I think the most can be achieved actually by getting at the very big institutions, the CEO and, 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 the, and the boards where they've got real downside. But I, I can tell you I was at Solomon you know, almost 20 years ago, and trying to put in a new compensation system in Wall Street can be very difficult. But I, I, right. I, 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 I don't retract any of those earlier remarks. I agree with them. <laughs> well, I, we, we, I asked it of Jimmy Kate, uh, Case at Bear Stearns, who, uh, Kane rather, and he <laughs> said that uh, – that's a great idea, but they're not going to like it, is what he said. You know, so, I mean, I guess it seems to me that, that and I want to go back to here to, to what happened at Moody's to some extent, because really, a hundred years ago, you know, John Moody started rating railroad bonds, which you know a lot about, right? Relatively simple instruments. Now, Moody's is rating exceedingly complex instruments. And some of the financial incentives, maybe I should turn to Mr. McDaniel on this question. Some of the financial incentives, it seems to me, are skewed in favor of your properly rating, besides the fact, the obviously glaring one, that issuers pay. But in your pricing, I learned from our investigation that on RMBS, on residential mortgage-backed securities, you charged 4.75 basis points for those tranches that were rated senior of the dollars in those tranches, and 3.7, 3.50 basis points for the tranches that were rated subordinate, which it seems to me gives a skewed incentive for you to put more dollars into the senior tranches and less dollars in the subordinate tranches because you're going to make almost 40 percent more per dollar rated in the higher rated ones, which is similar to a difficulty we've, we've discovered in the mortgage brokerage situation, where mortgage brokers sometimes were compensated at twice the rate, at the percentage rate, for generating a mortgage that had a higher interest rate uh, payable to the lender than a traditional mortgage, which then incentivized them twice as much to direct borrowers into, into uh, subprime mortgages and high interest rate mortgages who might otherwise qualify for, for uh, regular traditional ones. Mr. McDaniel, do you think that's a problem? And why, if you could tell us, did you actually structure the fees payable to Moody's in that way that gave you more if you rated them uh, senior than they would if they were subordinate? Well, I think, uh, as uh, you heard uh, uh, from the uh, panelists earlier today, uh, first of all, they, they uh, were not aware uh, of a difference in, in pricing. Um, in their deliberations or analytical work and rating committee work. Uh, and secondly, um, although I have not had an opportunity to do a comprehensive uh, check, um, I did go back to look at um, um, uh, RMBS uh, applications in 2006 and 2007, and the basis point fees were identical for senior and junior tranches. Well, our people say that they changed it in 2007 to flat, to 35 percent, which incidentally is a reduction in pricing power, uh, 3.5 uh, basis points uh, for all, all the way across in RMBS starting in 2007 forward, but 2006 prior, it was a differential. I was able to look at 2006, and it was identical in 2006 well, as then well. Well, we'll have but to, maybe as I you said, could, I did not have a chance to do a comprehensive right. maybe uh, you check could, of this. Maybe you could check that, check that out and report to us on it. Yes. The other point, I think, is that you got nine basis points for rating a CDO, which is, again, more than twice as much as you got for rating an RMBS, which, 
is sort of unclear to me how that could be. And does that then incentivize you to do more CDOs? Because you do a billion dollar CDO, you're going to make almost a million dollars in fees. And is that is it really that much harder to rate a CDO than it is to rate an RMBS? Uh, well, I'm not a, uh, a CDO analyst, um, so I, I, I can only respond with respect to the, the overall uh, approach. And if there is um, uh, an opportunity uh, uh, to charge uh, fees that uh, the market will uh, bear, um, I, I think we would do that. Um, we have uh, fees that uh, uh, range from, from very, very modest, particularly in the municipal bond sector, small municipalities, uh, to fees that are much more substantial for large corporations um, and, and complex securities. Right. Let, let me try. I want to press you a little bit on that. Mr. Buffett, did you have a comment on that? No, I was just thinking I was looking for the modest ones. I haven't found them yet. The, I'm, you're modest looking, fees that they referred to. It. Right. There, <laughs> there aren't too many. I, I don't seem to find them either. Looking back to this chart that Commissioner, uh, Commissioner uh, Graham uh, brought in front of you, it, it strikes me that when you look at this in the face of contradictory information, the actual number of deals rated in both CDOs and, and re residential mortgage-backed securities goes up dramatically. Um, and really, even after you've had four or five major downgrades, I mean, significant downgrades, you're still rating a whole bunch of deals that come forward. And I, I think that I'll sort of give you a pass to some extent on nobody knew that the market was going to go down as fast as it did, and everybody was was basically i don 't remember what your term was, Mr. Buffett, that everybody was believing in this this uh, as this bubble. but once you get contradictory information don 't you then have an obligation not to go forward and to be honest with you, it looks to me, given now that there's so few transactions in the marketplace, that what you were really trying to do was get these deals done so you could mop up the last bit of the gravy before they took the plates away. I mean, this is not, the, these deals are not out there anymore. There's not 9%, 9 basis point fees to be made on billion dollar CDOs every day anymore. And the fact that you did it in the face of contradictory information seems to me to be highly troubling. Do you have a thought on that? Uh, as long as, as securities are being offered uh, to the marketplace, uh, I think we have an obligation to try to offer our best opinion on those securities. Uh, so whether uh, the markets are active and robust or whether they are uh, quiet, uh, what is coming to market I, I think we uh, should attempt to offer an opinion on. Uh, we obviously want those opinions to be predictive. We want those opinions to incorporate um, all information that we think is relevant and incorporate our best judgment, but I do think we should try to offer the opinion. But they weren't any more predictive, were they? In fact, they led to downgrades just as significantly as they did prior to that. Is that not correct? Yes, Mr. Angelides. They, I, I don't know. I know you do. So do I. The, uh, there are two Greeks on this committee, uh, uh, gentlemen, which is a little bit dangerous for all of us here. But Mr. Buffett. But, but Mr. Buffett, do you think that that? I mean, do you do you? Do you fault the management of, of Moody's for at least that? I know you're reluctant to give them fault, but in the face of this contradictory information, how is it that they went forward and continued to rate these securities essentially no differently than they had been doing in the face of, of the bubble? And can I say that what I, the reason I was waving my hands, I want to put this in perspective. Offering an opinion is one thing. Offering an opinion that they're AAA is quite another. So just to frame this question yes, on my time, I think in 2007, $500 billion of RMBS was rated AAA, about $100 billion plus after July 07 when you began to do the downgrade. So right. difference in offering opinion, which may be this isn't rateable, shouldn't be rated investment grade, and then, in fact, rating an investment grade. Rating a AAA, and then, of course, they were then subsequently downgraded, even those later new issuances. Mr. Buffett? Yeah, well, it, I don't know what took place internally there, but it's not, just 
from listening to this and what I see here on the chart and so on, it looks like they tweaked their model when they should have gone at it with a meat axe, basically. Right. And, and, and it is sometimes difficult for people to adjust their thinking that much in a short period of time, but they should have gone at it with a meat axe. Yeah. Um, okay. Especially well, if they're on narcotics, correct? Well, that's right. I mean, uh, there are too many mixed metaphors here yeah, on occasion. Well. But, the, but uh, I guess I'd like to ask you if I could, I know you've, you've testified in your, uh, your internal testimony that you thought that the government made, did, made the right decision in backing up these companies, that the markets really needed reassurance uh, at the time. This is a more generic question not having to do with Moody's. Uh, but there are many who believe that that demonstrates the breadth and scope and, uh, of this crisis, that, you know, we've had so many other crises. I mean, Enron was the seventh largest corporation in America. It went bankrupt. The tech bubble f happened. A lot of other things have happened in the last 70 years, and none of them required trillions of dollars of taxpayer money at risk to bolster the private sector, and yet you feel that it was necessary at the time. Could you elucidate? I, I do. In September of 2008, you know, our financial system basically came to a halt. I mean, you had 30 million Americans with their money in money market funds comprising three and a half trillion, which close to half the deposits of the banks. And in the first three days of that week following Lehman, 170 billion flowed out. In interestingly enough, that was all institutional. Individuals hadn't caught on yet. But when people, 30 million people start worrying about whether their money market funds are going to be break the buck, when you've, right. got, when you've got commercial paper stopped in terms of issuance, uh, when you have, a little later, we sold a treasury bill due in April of 2009. We sold it in December for for $5 million and $90 when, it, when you were going to only get $5 million in April. So at that point, your mattress wasn't even good enough. I mean, a Treasury bill was $90 better than a mattress. Uh, so it was, it was a paralysis of the system, and the American people knew that only the government could pull us out. They didn't trust anybody else, and, right. and the government had to act. Whether they acted perfectly in every case, who knows? But they, right. the important thing is they acted. Okay, but now we're going forward. And yep. part of what we're to do here is to evaluate what happened in the financial crisis. And although we're not, we're not pr proposing remedies, certainly a lot of people are concerned about the debt that's been taken on to finance this bailout and so forth. What do you do in the future to avoid this occurring? Leverage and by the <coughs> way, uh, go ahead and answer, Mr. Buffett, if that's it, time, if we that's can let fine. That's Mr. Okay. Buffett answer, we would want, want your answer. Yeah, l l the two best things I know to attack are leverage and incentives. I mean, I don't want to, right. you've got a market system and, you know, you're not, you can't rearrange the whole thing, but you can change how people behave in one case by incentives, and then secondly, you just tell them, you know, how, how much rope they can use by the amount of leverage they can have when they're, particularly when they are, getting the benefit of government guaranteed money. Well, exactly. And you, I mean, let me just, one little follow-up, and that is your company, Make for example, small. has huge cash cushion, which you like to keep because it puts you in a, in a, in a right. protected, safe position to take advantage of opportunities. A, a lot of other people in this financial institution area did not do that. They ran every capital arbitrage possible to avoid holding back sure. as much capital. Right. And so that seems to me to be a related Yeah, problem. well, <clears throat> the AIG derivatives contracts you meant were, were to get around capital requirements in Europe. I mean, 300 billion of the, uh, so there, you know, there are a lot of abuse. And if you let those instruments exist in that form and let people use them in an unlimited manner, they will get used in an unlimited manner. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Georgia. you very much, gentlemen. All right, let's move on. Ms. Murren. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, I have a question for you about the events of the crisis. And when you look back at the financial crisis, I wonder if the requirement, the legislative requirement that, um, that asks certain investors to invest only in rated securities, if those requirements had not existed, how would your business have been different? Would you have had to compete on different terms, and would you have had to reward people within Moody's differently? Well, I don't know uh, exactly how the business would uh, uh, exist if there were um, uh, different or, or lesser um, uh, regulatory uh, uses of the ratings. 
Um, yeah, nonetheless, I am supportive uh, of a reduction of, of use of, of ratings in regulation. Uh, I, think it, uh, I think the use of, of ratings in regulation uh, offers rating agencies uh, a basis for competing other than on the quality of their ratings. They can compete on the, in effect, the certification um, that they have as, as a, uh, uh, a regulatorily approved rating agency. Uh, and, and I think that uh, rating agencies should um, uh, 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 either prosper or not prosper uh, based on whether market participants value uh, the ratings and value the rating opinions and research that accompany that. With that in mind, um, there were comments from some of the individuals that were here before this panel that suggested that they could not determine if there was a connection between their ability to get the ratings right, their words, and their actual recognition within the firm. Do you think that's true? Uh, we certainly um, try to reward people um, in terms of their position in the firm and their compensation uh, based on the, the quality of their work. Uh, it is um, a business in which it can take uh, a long time to evaluate the, the ultimate performance of securities. Uh, but their uh, research, uh, their preparedness for rating committees, uh, their, uh, uh, the, the robustness of, of their reasoning are things that can be judged, and, and we very much try to do that. Those things are process-oriented, though, not outcome-oriented necessarily. The, the, the outcomes are, are uh, able to be measured um, uh, at a, a broad level, um, statistically, to, to uh, uh, I think, a, a, uh, uh, to a strong uh, outcome. Um, it, it is more difficult to judge an individual's um, performance, especially in the short run, on a, a very limited number of, of credits. And, and so it is easier to measure this at, at a broad level than at a narrow level. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buffett, do you think that the investing world would be a better place if everyone had to do their own due diligence? Well, I certainly think at Berkshire Hathaway it's better. Uh, but, but there are people that, uh, that aren't equipped. I mean, the, the banking authorities, the insurance authorities uh, probably need to rely on some kind of standards to make sure that uh, people don't go t totally hog wild in terms of how they invest insurance funds which belong to their policyholders. But, uh, but uh, in the end, we don't use ratings. I mean, in, 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 from my standpoint, well, what we really hope for is, is misrated securities because that would give us a chance perhaps to, to uh, earn a profit if we disagree with uh, how, the, how the agencies rate them. Uh, there's one ironic point I, I, I should mention. If there were 10 rating agencies, all equally well regarded, all acceptable to the market, and you only needed one on when Berkshire Hathaway's is bond, we could have any one of them. Those 10 would compete either on price or laxity or both. I mean, they would be out there trying to get our business. And they, they would try by price, but they might also try by laxity. You can argue that if there was just one rating agency, they would have no reason to compete on either price or laxity. I mean, independence can really come with, a, uh, with strength in, in the business. You know, it, it, Ben Franklin said it's difficult for an empty sack to stand straight. So if you really had this situation where there was a lot of competition, I'm not sure that the rating agencies would be as independent actually in coming to their credit conclusions as they are. Um, I, I would hate to, to differ with you, <laughs> but um, if you look at a uh, if you look at, for example, equity research, there are a number of boutique shops that are specifically known for the quality of their research, and they do not engage in investment banking activities. So they don't have as much of a stake in the origination process. And to me, there's some parallel between um, those, this area of research and, and, and some others. Um, so I guess my question really is, if you change the way people get paid, you know, do you end up getting a different outcome? Um, so that was really in the nature of, of where I was headed with this. But I actually have a, an off-topic um, question for you, Mr. Buffett, and that is, I know that you've been largely a hands-off investor for Moody's, but I was curious about the due diligence process in your investment in Goldman Sachs, and if you could talk a little bit about your conversations with management there and, and how that decision was made. Well, that decision was made in, in September of 2008. We'd been approached by just about every firm 
uh, at least every firm that went under, uh, about putting money in. And, and uh, uh, when Goldman Sachs uh, was willing to take money on terms I found satisfactory, which had not been the case even the week before, uh, 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 I came to the conclusion that, uh, that unless the American financial system totally fell apart, that, that it was going to be a sound investment. And uh, uh, I had far more confidence in their risk management than I had in some of the other Wall Street firms that had come to me earlier. And uh, again, if the, if the system had fallen apart, if the Federal Reserve had not acted um, uh, in terms of commercial paper and, 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 and uh, the money market funds and all, uh, everyone would have been toast, I think, basically. Uh, but I came to the, my basic conclusion was that the American government would do what was necessary to get the engine started again. And if that was the case, Goldman Sachs was in fine shape. But they did um, change the terms they were willing to accept for your investment as uh, time but, went on. Yeah. The, prior to the middle of September, you know, they would not have paid us what they, remotely what they did, pay us for that preferred stock and the warrants. Um, and whenever it was, September 22nd or 23rd or sometime in, in that time frame. At that point, they not only wanted the money, but they wanted a show of confidence, obviously, in, in, in the fact that, that the world wasn't going to come to an end financially. And I didn't think the world was going to come to an end financially because I thought the federal government would act. I mean, I just I thought it was so obvious that it had to, and only it could do it. And I felt that our $5 billion would not be in any danger at all. Uh, uh, and the terms were attractive, and there were a lot of other things that were attractive then, too. But I made the decision that that was a good use for the $5 billion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holtz Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for spending time with us today. Um, Mr. McDaniel, uh, in your opening remarks, you were very forthright about the inherent conflict between providing uh, ratings to the market and running a public company for profit and uh, the incentives that issuers have to use the, the outcome of your rating process. How do you manage that conflict at Moody's? What, what do you put in place to keep that under control? Well, uh, from my office, uh, I think it's important to uh, emphasize and reemphasize uh, the fact that we are trying to create long-term uh, shareholder value. And, and I think the way to do that uh, is uh, to have uh, <coughs> credit ratings uh, that are uh, of high quality and predictive over time. Um, that is why uh, the problems we saw in, in the mortgage-related security sector were, were so devastating um, uh, to the firm um, in addition to the consequences for the larger um, economy and, and to, uh, to households uh, uh, in America. Uh, beyond that, though, we have um, structural uh, 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 components uh, of the firm that are designed to, to insulate and protect the analytical process from some of the uh, financial and commercial um, uh, interests uh, of the company. Uh, again, including uh, independent credit policy function. We've also uh, recently um, uh, created a, a separate uh, commercial organization in the firm that is, uh, that is separate and apart from either credit policy or uh, the, uh, the ratings uh, analysts and the lines of business. And to be clear, those are two recent changes in response to the problems you had? The, the credit policy function has existed for many years, but we've in, enhanced that function in terms of its independence um, in, in uh, uh, 2007. Uh, and the commercial group is, is a more recent um, uh, uh, introduction. Uh, we also have formally separated um, the rating agency from our other operating businesses, non-credit ratings businesses. Uh, so those kinds of, of uh, actions, I think, are uh, useful and important, not only for our own processes, but to be able to turn around and demonstrate that those processes are, are uh, proper and, and being handled in, in uh, the right manner. Right. So the quality of the ratings ends up being the key. And I, I think you said earlier that you want them to include all the relevant information and make them as good as possible. Absolutely. So I, I am then very interested in this situation that occurred in 2007 where you had the residential mortgage-backed securities um, clearly up for downgrade 
and at the same time are rating CDOs based on the same underlying RMBSs uh, and went ahead and rated them AAA. It doesn't seem like all the relevant information was brought into the rating process and how do you feel about that and in and the risk it placed to your reputation the quality of your ratings? Uh, I, I believe that, that all of the information we thought was relevant at the time was brought into the rating process, but obviously uh, we had the problem of underestimating the extent to which um, the, the uh, uh, housing downturn was uh, going to uh, its, its, uh, its magnitude um, and uh, how widely it was going to uh, affect um, uh, home prices uh, nationwide. Uh, so as a result, uh, the, even though we, we felt we were including uh, relevant information, we felt we were, we were um, uh, using uh, the best information we had uh, available in the rating committee process, it proved to be insufficient. And, and you, you couldn't wait until you found out a little bit more from your, your RMBS guys before you went out and rated the CDOs? Uh, or was the short-term pressure too great? The, I think the information that our RMBS teams had and, and their perspectives and opinions um, were available to uh, other teams um, as they developed and evolved. Uh, I think we were, we were trying to incorporate their changing points of view as we were looking at other securities related to, to the mortgage sector. Well, it at least appears, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, that, that this really do was a rush to get this stuff done. And um, it, it strikes me as central to, to your role. And Mr. Buffett indeed said, you as a CEO have to be your chief risk officer. And um, knowing the way in which these ratings were done and knowing when not to, to do them, wait and get, get more information. We heard from the panel earlier today about uh, a great desire to learn more about the, the cash flows underneath the CDOs, but, but such a study was not done. And pressures from uh, outside the organization to, to manage the market share, all of which are, were pretty striking testimony to uh, a real effort to move things out for short-term gain at the expense of what turned out to be your reputation and, and your long-run value. Well, I, we, we simply, if we thought that, that this, uh, the, the housing problems and, and the collateral consequences from the housing problem, uh, if we had thought they were going to be what they in fact have turned out to be, um, we would have had very different opinions on, on those securities. We, we just uh, underestimated and, and dramatically underestimated the significance of the downturn. Um, Mr. Buffett, uh, you've said that you're, you're interested in long-run value and not short-term profits. Um, were you aware of the, the problems in the structured credit, uh, housing-related structured credit ratings? Certainly not sufficiently. No, no I, uh, we... To my knowledge, I don't think I've ever bought a CDO or a, uh, a residential mortgage-backed security. We, uh, actually, we bought one recently here that we thought was mispriced, but uh, uh, it, it was not a field that I spent a lot of time on. It, uh, uh, it's just I was more interested in straight debt and, and equities. And, and uh, were you satisfied with the, the risk uh, measures, the, the internal controls at, at Moody's? Oh. And doing due diligence on uh, all the products they provided ratings on? I, I had no idea how. I, I've never been in Moody's. I, I don't know where they're located. You know, I, I, know, that, I know their business model uh, is extraordinary. And they have the ability to price. I want to come back to that. Um, yeah. But isn't it at odds with being confident of their long-run value to not know if they're doing due diligence for the asset they consider most important, no, which long. is their reputation? The long run value basically was in their position as part of a duopoly that, that arose naturally over a long period of time. And it Independent was a, of the quality of their ratings? Well, I, 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 I'm in no position to judge thousands of ratings. I think they misrate us. They've got us a notch I, below where Standard & Poor's has us, so that, clearly there's room to, for improvement. But, <laughs> but I, no, I've watched their process. They come out and they spend and Standard & Poor's does, too. Uh, they, they'll spend three hours with me. They'll go to all our managers, uh, and the key managers in our insurance businesses. And, uh, but three hours every year. And I, any question they ask me, you know, I give them the answer to. I give them, I give them my thoughts about the future, which I don't even with our own shareholders. But the, uh, uh, they have been diligent in terms of what I have seen 
at the Berkshire Hathaway level and, and in terms of our insurance. Now, they also have this incredible pricing power. I think they ought to be doing it at a much lower price as far as I'm concerned. And, of course, I think they ought to be rating us right up there where Standard & Poor's has us, but that's another question. And what is the source of the pricing power? What, what is the source of the pricing power? The, the source of the pricing power is that, that if you're an insurance company, to, as an example, or, but if you're any issuer mm -hmm. uh, of securities, people expect you to have a Standard & Poor's and Moody's rating. And it's very small, the dollar spent as a percentage of the total bond issue or whatever you may be doing, but it's required. It's, it, it's like an SEC filing fee. You know, I mean, basically, you're not going to come to market without it. And if the SEC doubles its price for filing fees, I pay it. If they triple it, I pay it. And, and there are certain things that are required as part of issuing securities. And in this country, an important part of the securities that are issued are required to have a Standard & Poor's and Moody's rating attached to them. And often, it's by statute. Mr. McDaniel, um, in your time and to your knowledge for your predecessor, has Moody's ever lobbied Congress or the regulatory agency to enshrine in statute or regulation a requirement for uh, ratings? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Um, just the opposite. We have been, uh, we have spoken repeatedly publicly going back at least 15 years um, about uh, the risks of including ratings and regulation and uh, uh, offering our support for the reduction or elimination of the use of ratings and regulation. I, I, would, I would say that they are required by regulation in yes. many of the Which situations. Is great for exist. pricing power. Yeah, it, it is. But, it, but if they weren't, we still would have to have them. I mean, now the world may change, maybe different 10 years from now or 20 years from now, but there's no way Berkshire Hathaway, even with a good reputation and, and all our earnings and, and CPA reports attesting to the fact that the 20 billion in cash is really there and all of that sort of thing, we, we will not be able to issue a bond without a rating. So what I hear you saying is that from the long-term value perspective, um, it's uh, that pricing power that matters, not the quality of the ratings, that the internal controls were not a great concern to you. Yeah, yield the uh, gentleman and, an additional two minutes. And that the conduct of Moody's and Standard Poor's, for that matter, through this episode no, I'm, was... I'm not in a position to evaluate the internal workings of Procter & Gamble. You're the majority Gamble. owner. I would think no, you'd no, be no, in a better we, position we, than most of us. No, we, we, we own a significant position in Procter & Gamble. I don't know how, what their internal controls are. I don't know how they make tide, you know, and whether the processes are proper. We own a lot of Johnson & Johnson. They had a problem in, at the McNeil lab recently. Mm -hmm. There's no way I'm going to know about that. And over time, I think Johnson & Johnson will do fine. I don't think they're going to do everything perfectly, but I think, generally speaking, their management has, has done a good job and will continue to do a good job. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going to take a minute or so to probe this. Don't, don't you believe that shareholders and boards who shareholders uh, elect have a threshold responsibility for the proper conduct of a corporation. And let me add to this. I mean, forget the housing price miss. There's now a whole set of information here, SEC reports, extensive testimony, I might add, not just two or three people about the culture at Moody's that may have jeopardized the ratings quality information that there were inadequate resources, inadequate pay. I don't think it's any secret that pay at the rating agencies that may be good for the bottom line revenue, but that pay was not sufficient to retain, to attract and retain the kind of quality of people we have. There's a meeting that Dr. Witt, who testified this morning, talks about that as the markets are coming apart in 07, 08, there's a big employees meeting and Mr. McDaniel's there and talking about how we're going to get it back on track, be profitable, and the managing director after 30 minutes of this finally stands up and says, after about 30 minutes of this, this is Dr. Witt's testimony, one of our MDs from the corporate sector says, are you going to talk about how we're going to ever salvage our reputation? Uh, you know, rather than just say, gee, I didn't know, don't you think a shareholder with 20 percent coupled with three or four others that have 50 percent, five of shareholders, and the board have a threshold responsibility in regard to these kind of operations. And that's number one. And number two is knowing what you know today. Are these matters of grave concern to you as a big shareholder? I would say in terms of, in terms of the behavior of the credit agency, recognizing all their limitations, aside from the, aside from the real estate bubble, I, I do not have a record of where they, uh, they have been further off in their in their in their ratings than I would expect a 
normal human beings to be. But it's not they, about I, matter of ratings. Take a look at the SEC report. We posted it. We'll post it on our web. Yeah. It, it talks about threshold issues like adequacy of resources, business considerations affecting ratings. Yeah. Well, all if we do, can't count on corporate shareholders, who can we count on? Well, we, I'll, I'll go back. You know, we, we own a very big chunk of Johnson & Johnson. In the papers in the last week, there's been a lot of material about, about uh, some children product, the, the McNeil thing. Am I going to investigate that? No. I mean, overall, I feel the Johnson & Johnson management is going to do a fine job over time and that they'll make mistakes and correct them. Now, if I see something, if I think they're overreaching or doing certain things... Uh, if you see a cockroach. Yeah. I do, I do, I do not regard... If, McNeil, if they have a problem with one lab, I do not regard that. They had a Tylenol problem many years ago, as you know. I mean, every... We no, have, I'm saying... I, I would say yeah. this today. We have 260,000 employees at Berkshire. Somebody's doing something wrong now. I, I wish well, I knew who it was, well, and I wish I could find fine. out. That's fine. There's a difference between that and systemic failure. I don't think it's been systemic failure. I think they made a huge mistake on the Have you looked bubble. at the SEC report, at least the public one? No, I haven't. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, much can be said about tone at the top. And so would you just tell me what outcomes or results you value most from your company? Well, the uh, uh, somewhat similar to a remark I made a few minutes ago, um, obviously we want to, I want to have uh, a successful business. Uh, and I believe the way to have a successful business is to have uh, high quality products and services, uh, in this case ratings and related research. Um, it, it does nothing uh, uh, for our business uh, to focus uh, on the short run and, and to cut corners. Uh, and as I've said, that's why it is uh, so deeply disappointing to have had the experience that we've had in, in the mortgage-related securities that we've rated. Yeah. So quality of the product or service that you deliver would be the one outcome that you value most? Yes, because I believe that leads to the, the long-term uh, prosperity Understood. of the firm. Yeah. So why then is quality not a major component in the compensation plans for the managing directors who rate these securities? Uh, first of all, um, I, I think uh, um, it is. Uh, and and uh, we have adjusted our compensation uh, programs uh, uh, over time in order to try and, and align uh, high quality product and service um, with compensation. Uh, our uh, senior management team, the top uh, the senior most 40 individuals in our firm, uh, now have as part of their compensation uh, program a uh, three year uh, performance share plan. Uh, and for everyone involved in the Moody's Investor Service rating agency business in that group, uh, there is 50% uh, 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 of that plan is based on the statistical performance of our ratings over that three-year period. You said now. It, yes. When was that change made? This, this was introduced at the end of last year. Yeah. Okay. So this is, is, is after the crash, if and, you will. And it's, it's really an experiment. Um, we will have to see how this works. Um, the, the ability to... Uh, measure rating statistically over a multi-year period um, is, is something we can do, and, and we think that uh, it's going to provide good incentive alignment for our, our senior management. So in keeping with the notion of tone at the top, then you would say that in your communications and your most senior team's communications with the rank and file of Moody's, it's clear that quality trumps market share. Uh, well, from, from my... Uh, position, I have to be concerned with um, all different aspects of, of trying to manage a, a successful business. Uh, but for uh, our more junior employees, um, their compensation, uh, our analysts um, and, and uh, support uh, analysts, uh, their compensation is in, in no way uh, tied to the number of uh, securities they rate or the number of companies they follow or anything of that sort. Or the share they gain in the market or the share that, that they gain or, or that we lose um, in the market. So the gentlemen who were here earlier were delusional about what objectives and goals they really had as they were working at Moody's? No, as I said, I, I care about market share. I care about 
market coverage um, as much as I care about market share, even if that coverage is, um, is uh, uh, produced on an unpaid basis. I still want to have market coverage. Uh, but uh, I, I also um, care deeply about ratings quality. And, and part of my job is to balance those um, uh, uh, interests um, uh, properly and to communicate that balancing of interests uh, throughout the firm in a way that, that individuals understand that the, the long-term success of this company has to start with product and service quality, ratings quality, research quality. Okay. Uh, Mr. Buffett, much, much has been said about regulatory or supervisory failure through this debacle. Um, the SEC, OFAO, you name the regulator that was involved, any number of them missed. Um, other than over-the-counter derivatives, can you think of a major area of regulatory oversight that dictates major changes in our system? Well, I'm, I, I would say that going beyond the OTC derivatives, I, mean, I, I, think, I, I think that addressing the problems of, of disguised leverage Unwise leverage, which is really tough, but but there, doing it with ratios is not is not the answer. It's not the sole answer. Uh, but leverage is what gets people in trouble. I mean, uh, uh, that, uh, we run Berkshire that way, and uh, uh, when when people stretch and they get rewards for it, they're inclined to stretch more. I think I heard some testimony that. And, and, uh, an earlier panel you had about you know whether having an, the objective of return on equity whether that might cause people to do different things well of course it does <laughs> people to do different things and the easiest way to jack up return on equity is to leverage and so addressing that addressing it wisely I think is very tough I mean you know uh, but I think that that's the most important thing in the in the regulatory world are you as surprised as most Americans are that post Enron we could have off-balance sheet financing that would have been perhaps at the core of this collapse. Yeah, I don't know that it necessarily at the core, but I would certainly was surprised when Citigroup turned out to have sieves, you know, in the many tens of billions, you know, which is just a way of jacking up leverage again. Uh, uh, I was surprised. I mean, but, uh, uh, now I may not have read the 10 Ks carefully enough or anything, but. There certainly were no flashing signs that said we're using a bunch of leverage off off balance sheet, and uh, so I, I think that uh, I think you're always going to be fighting the human tendency to borrow more money than you should, and households did it because they thought that houses were going to go up next year. They really didn't think it made any difference what their income was because they'd refi in a year or two, and it's just such a human tendency that that you need something on the governmental side to balance that, to counterbalance that. Thank you very much. Before we go to Ms. Bourne, I just, for, can I just ask for the, if we get supplied with a couple pieces of information? Can we have made available to us uh, the board's evaluation of your CEO? Uh, do they do an annual evaluation? Uh, I, I submit a self-evaluation, which the board uh, then reviews and discusses among themselves. And, can you provide and, access to that to us? Yes. Okay. Secondly, can we also have access to any internal comprehensive reviews that have been done about practices at Moody's to the extent we haven't already received them? In other words, reviewing systemic breakdowns that might have been done. Have you done comprehensive reviews internally in the wake of all this? Well, we've done a number of, of reviews, and, and if, if there's anything that we haven't uh, okay. pr provided that's appropriate, I certainly would instruct our people to do so. And then finally, I, I think the, the, the uh, company did a review with a law firm of Mr. Kolchinsky's employment retaliation um, allegations. Can that be made available to us? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I don't know if there is a, a report on that or not. I believe there is. I believe there is. Check it out. And if Mr. Kolchinsky agrees, I would hope that you would also. Can you please check it out? Thank you. I, I will check, yes. All right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, for the record, especially since uh, we have witnesses in front of us, which we say you ought to know more about your business, um, and, and someone else's business, notwithstanding the fact you're looking at it from a different perspective, I would like to place on the record the fact that um, the Commission uh, will examine uh, the assertion uh, that we've made, which we believe to be accurate, 
that um, there were various rates charged for uh, different tranches, uh, and uh, if need be, correct the record, and if not, be proud that we were right, but we're going to get the answer correct one way or the other. As I said, I, I did not have an opportunity for a comprehensive check on that. So. And, and, we, and, and neither have we, but we believed it to be accurate, so we're going to get to the bottom of it. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bourne. Thank you very much, and <clears throat> thank you both for appearing before us. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I'm going to take advantage of your being here by asking you about uh, derivatives and your views of them. As Mr. Wallison has said, uh, your 2002 Berkshire Hathaway uh, shareholder letter famously referred to derivatives, and this is, I believe, all derivatives, not just yeah, credit derivatives, derivatives mm -hmm. as, quote, financial weapons of mass destruction carrying dangers that, while now latent, are potentially lethal, end quote. You also presciently said that they are, quote, time bombs, both for the parties that deal in them and the economic system, end quote. And more recently, in your 2008 shareholder letter, you said that Bear Stearns' collapse demonstrated the time bomb of counterparty risk that you had earlier described. And I would ask that these two shareholder letters be placed in the record. And they will be. I would like you to uh, describe your view of the role that derivatives has played in the current financial crisis. Well, they have accentuated enormously, in my view, the, the leverage in the system, the, the huge uh, dependency on counterparties, uh, and one of, the, one of the beauties of, of the stock exchange over the years is that you've had now a, a three-day clearing system because people realize that if you, if you have a contract and it's six months later that uh, it settles, that a lot of things can happen in those six months. In fact, I think the Kuwait stock exchange got into big trouble some years back because they had a very delayed clearing arrangement. And derivatives are contracts with sometimes unbelievably long uh, uh, settlement periods. At Genry, we inherited 23,000 derivative contracts. I could have hired the 50 smartest PhDs out of MIT to prepare some kind of report that would tell me the risk I was bearing, and I never, I wouldn't have gotten the answer. I mean, it was impossible to get your mind around that. We had 900 counterparties. I couldn't pronounce the names of a couple of hundred of them. I mean, they were foreign institutions I never heard of. And in effect, the integrity of our balance sheet at Genry was dependent upon all of these people behaving at times in the future which struck out, which strung out to almost 100 years in a few cases. So the only answer was to get out of the business. I couldn't design a system that would enable me to know what the hell was going on. So if that was my problem with 23,000 of them, uh, you know, I've read about vastly greater numbers that existed at Bear Stearns or at Lehman and something. I just think institutions can get out of control. And I don't think that that's a good thing for the system, particularly when if, they, if they're large enough, if they get out of control, it means that uh, society gets disrupted in a very, very major way. Well, following up on that notion, uh, I think you stated in your 2008 letter that the Federal Reserve rescued Bear Stearns because the counterparty risk posed by its enormous position in derivatives would have created, quote, a financial chain of unpredictable magnitude. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, and what happened, of course, I think in Lehman was that we, we saw an example of that. I think it was underappreciated. And I'm not saying I would have called it right either, but, but uh, uh, when Lehman failed, an institution that was showing 15 or so billion of book equity, now some of it was real estate deals and some of that, but in the end, the debt of 140 billion or whatever it was is now selling for maybe 30 billion in the market. So that's 110 billion. Uh, that kind of money shouldn't disappear overnight. And with respect to the other large uh, derivatives dealers, AIG and the large investment banks and bank holding companies that needed TARP money, do you think that 
played a role with respect to them as well? Yeah, I, I think the government did the right thing in stepping in an AIG, but I don't think AIG should have gotten there in the first place. And AIG is, you probably know better than I, 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 think, I think there was 300 billion of derivatives that were essentially designed for something called regulatory arbitrage, which was just a way of relieving the capital pressures on European banks because they got the AAA of AIG transferred over. Well, if you get enough of that sort of thing going on in a financial system, you're going to have a problem. Well, in light of the problems that you and uh, the other people at Berkshire Hathaway experience with the General Ray derivatives position, What's your view of the ability of these enormous derivatives dealers to successfully manage their companies in light of their enormous positions? For example, they hold millions of contracts. Yeah. Uh, at year-end 2009, the OCC said that J.P. Morgan's position was $78.6 trillion in notional amount. And can such enormous complex books of business be successfully managed by human beings? I think they're dangerous. And I, I, I would say this, I don't think I could manage it. But uh, 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 you know, uh, it's hard, to, it's hard for me to imagine a system, and it's hard for me to imagine a regulatory system that can supervise something like that. And of course, one of the ironies is that with only four big auditing firms in the United States, I will guarantee you that if you take two big firms that are audited by the same auditor, you will find different prices attributed to given derivatives contracts at the same time that, are, that, that the auditor attests to. I mean, it. it it's mind-boggling. And the 23,000, you mentioned our getting out of it, we lost $400 million in a very benign period with no pressures on us, able to exit, and, and that's why maybe Lehman lost $100 billion, but it, it's, it's very dangerous stuff. You've also pointed out that in your, I think, most recent uh, shareholder letter, the 2008 one that I'm referring to, not the 2009, that uh, it's almost impossible for an investor looking at the financial statements of these big uh, derivatives dealers to really know what their financial situation is. Is yes, that and right? Yes, and I think if you added 1,000 pages to the disclosure, it would be impossible to. I, I try in our report, because we only have 250 positions, I try to tell the shareholders what basically the positions are. And, and I think I can do that. With, but that's all, because there's only a couple classes of them, and I can describe them. And uh, uh, I think so that anybody that knows accounting, at least, can, can understand what I'm talking about. But I don't know how, I, I don't know how to read a 10K, whether it's 300 pages long or 3,000 pages long, that can describe a million derivative contracts. Now, you're a very sophisticated uh, investor. And I assume in going into uh, derivatives contracts, you carefully examine what the embedded risks are, what the leverage uh, is. I'm concerned that so many municipalities and other uh, large institutional investors that may not have your sophistication have gone into these contracts I'm concerned that the embedded risks and the leverage aren't fully understood. No, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And I mean, you had Orange County, you had Jefferson County in Alabama. But more importantly, if you go back a ways, when Bankers Trust was selling them to P&G, I mean, can you imagine bamboozling the CFO of P&G? So it, when you get these exploding type contracts where if you had a given threshold, everything gets multiplied by 10 or I don't even know, you know, why in the world they're needed. But, but there, those contracts are out there and I don't, I think many times the people that are they're buying them don't know what they're doing. There's been enormous growth in this market. Uh, the Bank for International Settlement said that globally the market amounted to more than $614 trillion at the end of last year. There's enormous innovation that's been going on, financial innovation. There's enormous complexity in these contracts. 
I understand that they are very useful for hedging purposes, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate sure. purpose. I think you need some speculators in order to allow hedgers to effectively uh, enter into positions. I'm concerned about the enormous growth of purely speculative transactions in the market, and I wonder what your view is as to the economic benefit to our society from that speculation. Well, I wrote a letter in 1982 to Congressman Dingell giving my views when they were introducing the S&P index future. And I said there are legitimate uses for it, hedging out long positions and so on, but I said overwhelmingly it's going to become a gambling vehicle. And I would distinguish between speculative and gambling. Gambling in, in involves, in my view, the creation of a risk where no risk need be created. Now, obviously if you plant a crop in the spring and you're going to harvest in the fall, you are speculating on what prices are going to be in the fall for your corn or oats or whatever it may be, and you may lay that off on some other speculator. That, but that's a risk that the system has to take. You can't, you can't grow it in one day. But when you start wagering on, 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 uh, well, on stock index futures, I think that, uh, that uh, gambling instincts are very strong at, 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 in humans. I mean, people went a thousand miles to a bunch of sand originally, you know, and they built a whole, a whole city on it. And they would, they would travel on planes and go to all kinds of things to do mathematically unintelligent activity. So it exists. States prey on it with their, with their, their lotteries. And, and uh, these, these contracts are made to order for it because you can do it on a big scale and you can do it and it's very easy to do. And, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to get on a plane. You don't have to break a sweat. And, and, uh, and I would say that... Put <laughs> for, uh, put down any money. Yeah, yeah, and and the more complex, generally speaking, the more profit there's going to be for the derivatives dealer. That you can you can take that as a given. When I was at Solomon, originally you talked about interest rate futures, you know, fixed to floating or foreign exchange, and then they became known as plain vanilla contracts because there wasn't any money in them. Uh, they, it got competed away, so they invented more more uh, exotic instruments, and that's where the money was. Well, I would ask Last that question. the uh, 1982 letter by Mr. Buffett to John Dingle be placed in the record. One last we question. We have it. It's typed on a Smith Corona typewriter, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's it's our a, most recent it's a piece a of purchase. Copy. <laughs> uh, Mr. Buffett, in your view, is the derivatives market still a time bomb ticking away? I would say so. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield the Commissioner Holtzik in one minute. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Prophet, I, I really appreciated that testimony because what you said about the derivatives and your response to them was you needed, you needed to manage your balance sheet, in which case just got rid of balance sheets exposed. Unusual statement in the context of these hearings. We have heard again and again and again that uh, whether it be a Citigroup or a Fannie Mae that, you know, they didn't manage their balance sheet. They just got overwhelmed by something so large that it could not have been imagined. And had everybody simply managed the risks on their balance sheets appropriately, something that large could not have emerged. And so uh, it, it is important to come back to that. And I think it's important in light of this hearing because uh, at, at, at the heart of the question that, that faces us today is the question of what was the management of the balance sheet of these rating agencies? Was the asset being managed, their, their reputations? And if so, was due diligence done in pricing the most valuable risks, risks that are correlated with the most important thing going on in the economy, or was there effort devoted elsewhere to uh, the ability to manage volume and, and take advantage of pricing power? Which asset management strategy was in place? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I would yield uh, Commissioner Wallinson the remainder of the time until the 2 o'clock end of the well, it's, it's, the it's 2 o'clock, but why don't we just say a couple minutes then? Yeah, a couple oh, minutes I kind of like the more dramatic way <laughs> I, I said it. <laughs> well, you tell him it's two minutes, he doesn't think it, he gets or, or a minute, which is an empty <laughs> offer since it's 2.01. Oh, come on, stop fighting, guys. Let me ask my question. <laughs> Go. Um, look, one of the issues that is central to, the, uh, to this hearing today, it seems to me, is whether um, the problems at Moody's, and I think we'd all agree there were some problems at Moody's, are systemic in the sense that they extend across the board throughout in Moody's, or are simply unique to the housing mortgage area. And uh, one of the ways we can address that is by looking at how successful Moody's, or unsuccessful, Moody's has been in rating 
non-housing asset-backed securities. Um, so, Mr. McDaniel, what I would like you to do is to assemble as much information as you can on the other kinds of non-housing asset-backed securities that Moody's has rated and give us a sense of the number of downgrades or even upgrades that occur from time to time in those securitizations. That way, we can compare the way Moody's operates as a general rule against what happened in the very unusual housing area, which, as you've pointed out, uh, has uh, shocked everyone, including the estimable uh, Mr. Buffett. So uh, what I think we want to do is, is see that data. And if you furnish it to us, get it together and furnish it to us, um, even without a question from us, that would be very helpful. Be happy to do so, sir. Thank you. All right, last comment as we wrap up here. As I've read the materials provided by the staff, read innumerable interviews, other background materials, I'm struck with the fact that with respect to the credit rating agencies' practices and models, it seems to me that the question isn't so much why did this system fail, but why has it lasted so long? And in that vein, I just want to ask you today, what risk do you see from the current credit rating models in the same way you said there are risks for derivatives? Do you see extant risk, current risk, from the model essentially being unchanged from where it was when the mistakes, the disaster, however you characterize it, happened? Well, the huge question if you were running a rating agency now, if I were running a rating agency now, or if you own 13 percent of the stock, how would how would I how would I rate states and major municipalities? I mean, if the federal government will step in to help them, they're AAA. If the federal government won't step in to help them, who knows what they are? And I mean, if if you're looking now at something where you could look back later on and say these ratings were crazy, that would be the area because it's 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 bimodal. I mean, basically. Uh, uh, and um, are you satisfied? I, I, don't, the I, don't, I don't know how I would rate those myself now. I mean, in other words, it, because it's a bet on how the federal government will act over time. But the real question, well, but also have you, in that vein, have you looked at whether the resources, the discipline, the capacity is there internally at Moody's? I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Moody's or Standard & Poor's or I can come up with anything terribly insightful about the question of state and municipal finance five or ten years from now, except for the fact that there will be a terrible problem, and then the question becomes, will the federal government But help? does the model, irrespective of the particular eminent risk, is the model one that still pre pre presents risk, given what you've heard and learned today in looking at Moody's? Well, I, I think you're talking about the model in respect Talk about the model, issuer pays, uh, all the associated issues we've raised with respect to the Moody's business model. I think there's utility to the to the rating agencies. I think there's less rate, utility to somebody like me who's in the business of trying to evaluate credits day by day and been doing it a lot of years. But I think there's utility to the model. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we might as well end on a high note. If we're really looking at the states and municipalities and the comfort that we would get from the federal government uh, proposing to intervene, which then makes the states and the municipalities triple A, there are a lot of folk out there wondering who watches over the watcher uh, in terms of how the federal government is able to do that. Of course, we know they can print their own money and do a few other things, but they've been doing that for some time now. And there is some concern about that as well. I, I, I do like to go back to what we talked about in the beginning. Behavior should have consequences that should apply to people, institutions, and governments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, witnesses. We are going to take a break, member, uh, members, uh, until 2.30, and we will reconvene in this room. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Thank you. Thank you.